do you fear something? Uh, I'm curious what people think about the way that Biden's presidency has made the media so much more reluctant to criticize and cover things. So part of this speaks to what we mean when we say political. And I, and I appreciate Norman describing this as a political prosecution. A lot of people, when they hear the word political, they think of partisan, you know, where you've got two different parties in Washington, they fight each other seemingly over everything, except that the two parties in Washington agree on a great deal. And they particularly agree on an imperial foreign policy that, you know, to, to borrow Norman's phrase, you know, might makes right. That is a consensus in Washington that brings the political parties together. And so this is a political prosecution in the sense of the bipartisan Washington military industrial complex defending itself, you know, going back to, I think it was Marjorie who, who made this point about the, the defensive aspect of it. Um, and so when we talk about politics, I just want to introduce this point that you know what we are trained to think of as politics in the United States is very different than what we mean when we talk about politics in this sense, because it's the united political branches and parties of the United States undermining again, international commitments that, that we fought and, and sacrificed lives to establish. Um, you know, when you, what I fear really at the end of this is not only the timidity of journalists who, you know, let's be frank, are responding to Biden in the context of having just had to cover Trump. And so, you know, the opportunity to expose the daily lies of a chief executive, you know, then transitioning to covering a chief executive whose corruption is maybe not as overt, but is absolutely as inextricable as his predecessors. I think it's a beguiling um, moment that we're in, and and too many journalists, I think, you know, practice access journalism as as distinct from exposure journalism. And I see the Biden administration uh, unfortunately repeating some of the plays that we saw in the playbook of the Obama administration. You know, this sort of uh, he hasn't had a, held a press conference yet. This idea of relying on you know videos that make them look cool instead of answering hard questions about what the hell is going on in Washington. That's their job, not sending videos you know of him walking in slow motion you know under the columns. Like I don't care you know what shoes Kamala Harris is wearing or you know I just want to hear our leaders own up to the facts. And that's the job of the press. And I fear not only that the press will become intimidated through this prosecution. I frankly fear that the press has been uh, sort of lost the capacity to perform its ethical function, even independent of the crackdown. And just to chase that, you know, to, to untug on that thread, when you have a press that has lost its institutional capacity and or is intimidated institutionally from fulfilling its constitutional role, what we have then is an ignorant public spoon-fed information and led by the nose into who knows what limit of international crimes. We've seen a bunch in the last 20 years. I fear the next round, and it's precisely what we can expect if the press is not emboldened. You know, when Biden attacked Syria and Iraq and said, oh, we were protecting, um, we were protecting U.S. soldiers who don't belong there in the first place, <laughs> Um, against Iranian-backed forces without evidence, even if even if it were legal to do what he was doing, almost no pushback by the corporate media. And to pick up upon uh, what Shahid talked about, which is basically the policy of U.S. imperialism that um, has spanned every uh, every presidential administration all the way back. Um, you heard Obama say. Uh, you heard Trump say, or you're hearing Biden say, um, we have to lead. America has to lead. We are exceptional. We have to reclaim our moral authority in the world. You know, when has the United States ever had moral authority? You know, this country was was birthed um, in, in uh, genocide against First Nation peoples, um, slavery of Africans, and we talk about moral authority um, and, and how we have to lead, the rest of the world doesn't want our leadership. Um, they really don't. They want us to be a partner with other countries, not commit war crimes, not illegally invade other countries, and yet you get almost no pushback or even questioning of this policy of U.S. imperialism, let's call it what it is, by the corporate media. I, I think these points really made by uh, 
Shahid and Marjorie are context for the prosecution, the attempts to extradite and then prosecute Julian Assange, uh, because it's really the underpinning of a mindset of a political economy, of a media atmosphere, and the political control of the executive branch, as well as the, really the other two branches of the US government. It's an assumption uh, that US dominance of the world should be accentuated as much as possible. And let's face it, WikiLeaks really threw a monkey wrench into that war machinery. And that's not appreciated. It's a precedent that uh, those in power and largely bipartisan outlook in Washington, they want to squelch, not uh, not let it grow. And so the Biden administration two months in uh, clearly um, is an effort in some respects to go back to the future. Uh, there is a decent analogy to the mid 1960s where with the great society programs and support for civil rights, the Johnson administration justifiably uh, earned a lot of support from the progressives of the day. At the same time, the Johnson administration was escalating a murderous war in Indochina and, and people in Vietnam were being slaughtered at the same time. And you could draw a rough analogy to today. Uh, there was a very good article that was written by one of the only really progressive columnists of the Washington Post, Katrina Vanden Heuvel, uh, just in, in recent days where she pointed out that on domestic policies, of course, progressives want a lot better from Biden, but it's notably better than Trump's. And it has a lot of good elements of Biden uh, domestic policy. You get to his foreign policy, uh, it's a continuation of an imperial view of US dominance of the planet, tremendous militarism, killing people often in secret in many different countries. It's the continuation of respecting what we could call the third rail of US politics, which is US empire overseas. And so in that context, it's a attention for uh, some of the mainstream media establishment and other commentators who were esteemed in this country. Uh, what do we do? We, we, we like Biden, uh, what he's doing domestically. We feel good, we're glad to get rid of Trump. Uh, oh, and uh, uh, Biden's uh, proceeding with what Trump initiated, which is the extradition of Julian Assange. Oh, well, they're not going after our favorite newspapers and magazines and website. They're not going after Daily Beast or Huffington Post or the New York Times or NPR or the Washington Post. And so there's sort of a walk away from responsibility. And part of our organizing uh, capacity has to be to rev up, to insist to everyone in the United States, uh, including definitely pointedly the establishment, we're not going to stand for attacking the First Amendment uh, in the process of attacking Julian Assange. You also had people actually, embarrassingly enough, saying when Trump did, um, I'm sorry, when Biden went into, uh, uh, did what he did in Syria, you had people, blue checks on Twitter, thanking him and expressing gratitude that he was so nuanced about it. And it was so kind of no fanfare. It was so subtle. It's like, do you know, do you want Cambodia? Like, is that what you want? You want secret mm -hmm. bombings? That's something good? I mean, it's unbelievable. And the same people would, during the uh, the Trump era, the Trump years, they would push him to, they never focused on what he was doing abroad that was at all bellicose, uh, belligerent as a problem. In fact, they would always try to get him to be more belligerent against Putin, which never made right. sense to me because the same people calling him Cheeto Mussolini, um, unprecedented threat, and I'm not a Trump fan, obviously, but the same people who would say that also wanted him to be um, engaged, you know, be more belligerent with with Putin and Kim Jong Un, and it made no sense. Like, what was the end game there? They you know, always attacked what? him from the right. They always attacked him from the right. Like, I, it was so frustrating. Go, Marjorie. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say one of the most frightening and disturbing things about the Biden administration's foreign policy is rattling the sabers against Russia and China and beefing up our nuclear weapons cash. Um, that's really frightening. Uh, that's not just, you know, trading words. We're talking about nuclear armed powers and, uh, you know, calling Putin a killer. Well, of course, Putin's a killer. And so is Biden. He's killing people now as well. Um, but that was so unnuanced the way he said that. 
um, and and you know really open the door to Putin saying, well, you know, it takes one to know one, etc. But aside from all the rhetoric, it's really dangerous. It's really frightening um, that that yes, Biden is pursuing a much better domestic policy. We breathe the sigh of relief. He's finally getting a handle on the pandemic, which Trump criminally allowed to um, to metastasize and kill people. But his Biden's foreign policy is really dangerous and really frightening. And even on domestic issues and COVID, I would just add that we need to be really re uh, vigilant because the media certainly isn't being that with Biden's decisions around that. And a lot of the press uh, the spokespeople are speaking out of both sides of their mouths. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden it's a three feet, three feet difference. And they're also not doing anything to help bring the vaccines to other countries. And um, they really, I mean, there's very little transparency and his press people are kind of more talented or more less tacky uh, versions of Trump's, I would say. Well, well, some issues. intersection, uh, you know, one uh, sort of convergence of, of your point, Katie, and the venom, the hostility, the rage against Julian Assange is the Democratic Party establishment, the Clintonites, the Obamanites, and the reality is, let's face it, uh, Julian Assange was very hostile to Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton was very hostile to Julian Assange. And the Clinton machinery, Bill, Hillary, Neera Tandon, Center for American Progress, the whole infrastructure of neoliberal Democratic Party so-called leadership, they despised Julian Assange because uh, they thought they would win in 2016. They had to blame somebody. They couldn't blame themselves right. for Hillary Clinton being a flunky for Wall Street and choosing to take six-figure uh, honorarias for speaking for an hour and all this. So, you know, there's a reality in, in the book Shattered that documents uh, uh, by two uh, reporters from The Hill that 24 hours after Hillary Clinton lost, they had a meeting at their Brooklyn headquarters. Who are we going to blame? So we're going to blame Russia. Well, coming along with that is, well, let's blame Julian Assange. Yeah, Aaron Maté calls that the um, privilege protection racket. That's what he calls the Russian narrative for all the consultants and campaign people. Yep. It's, yeah. it's not unwarranted because it is, there, there's, in the same way that the you know, Eisenhower described a military industrial complex. What we're describing now is almost like the press industrial complex or the political industrial complex yeah. uh, that, that supports it, enables it, obscures it. Thanks for watching. If you want to support our mission to transform politics into service, please like this video, subscribe, follow us on social media, and consider joining our Patreon, where you'll get early access to our interviews as well as other exclusive content. Links are in the description. Peace out.